Welcome everyone to this Federalist Society virtual event as this afternoon, March 22nd, 2022, we're hearing about spectrum policy in the 5G era. We have a terrific panel lined up today. Um, I'm just going to briefly introduce our moderator before she takes it away. Quickly, some housekeeping. I'm Nick Moore, Assistant Director of Practice Groups at the Federalist Society. Please note that expressions of opinion on today's call are those of our experts. Um, we're joined today to moderate this great discussion by Danielle Thuman. She's a legal advisor to Commissioner Brendan Carr at the FCC, and she helped put this webinar together. Webinar sponsored by the Telecommunications and Electronic Media Practice Group of the Federalist Society. Towards the end of the call, we'll be looking to you, our audience, for questions. So please submit those through the chat as we go along, and we'll get to as many as we have time for at the end. With that, thank you very much all for being here. Danielle, thank you especially. I'll give the floor to you. Great, thank you so much, Nick, and thank you to the Federalist Society for allowing us to have this webinar today. Um, and special thanks to our panelists for joining for the discussion. Um, I will start with some brief introductions of our three panelists. Um, first, we have Adam Kandub, who is Professor of Law and Director of the Intellectual Property Information and Communications Law Program from Michigan State University. Next, we have Harold Feld, who is the Senior Vice President for Public Knowledge. Third, we have Patricia Pauletta, who is a partner with the law firm of Harris, Wiltshire, and Granis. Um, today, we are going to be focused on spectrum policy in the 5G era and the increased involvement um, by other agencies in some of the FCC's spectrum proceedings. Um, because there are a lot of issues at play here, and we often have um, some non-telecom folks that join in the audience, I thought it would be helpful to um, set the stage a bit and provide some history and some background before turning things over to the panelists um, for a deeper dive. So while the, the uh, Commerce Department initially actually had authority to assign commercial spectrum licenses. Um, that duty was then assigned to the Federal Radio Commission all the way back in 1927, and then later to the FCC through the Communications Act of 1934. And NTIA, by contrast, has retained the authority to um, administer and uh, manage spectrum for federal use. Through the Communications Act, the FCC has the authority today to issue licenses for spectrum, to regulate interference, um, to determine the types of services that a licensee can render, um, the power levels that they can use for equipment and more. Um, the FCC has also been given uh, spectrum auction authority from Congress. And a really important piece of the FCC's decision-making process is ensuring that spectrum does not lay fallow and is put to its best and highest use. But the FCC does not do any of this in a vacuum. It's required to consult with NTIA before initiating a proceeding to look at any particular spectrum bans. Um, the FCC then engages in its rulemaking um, or proceeding process and follows EPA guidance for that rulemaking before any decision is ultimately reached for any particular spectrum ban. Um, these, these proceedings take time. Um, they heavily involve industry and other stakeholders and um, also involve a detailed engineering analysis. Um, in recent years, however, other agencies, including the Department of Transportation, the Department of Defense, um, NOAA, just to name a few, have become more engaged with the FCC's um, proceedings as the demand for spectrum continues to increase and the need and importance of sharing has continued to rise. Um, as broadband connectivity has continued to become more ubiquitous um, to all sectors of the economy, different industries have um, become a little bit more laser focused on their own connectivity needs and um, protecting their spectrum turf a little bit, if you will. Um, but there have been some instances from my perspective where um, the other agencies have kind of circumvented the process that was set up by Congress. Um, and as a result, we've had a lot of conflicts of interest, some delays and some other challenges. Um, so what we're going to explore today is the potential long-term impact of these battles, um, 
where changes to the process may be warranted. Um, and from my perspective, it's very important that the FCC's authority here and expertise be kind of reinforced um, as, part, as, as part of any uh, future uh, uh, spectrum strategy. So with that, let me first turn things over um, to Trisha to kick us off um, by building a little bit of the, uh, building a little bit on the history and background. Um, and if you'd like to provide your perspective as well, that would be really helpful of some of the recent trends. I was muted. Sorry. Thank you, Danielle. And uh, I should start too by saying any perspective I do offer, you know, are, is my own uh, perspective and doesn't reflect on Harris Wilcher Grannis's clients because we've got. Lots of them with different interests and in different bands. So this is all me. Yeah, as you said, there, we have a long and storied uh, history on spectrum management. And it is, you made me think too, Danielle, while you were speaking, like, wow, in, in 12 short years, we can start celebrating the 100th anniversary of the 1934 Act. So something to look forward to. But yeah, it, it, as you said, there is increasing competition for spectrum because of broadband's importance, right, in, in our lives. So it, I think some of the recent battles we've seen have been, uh, as you suggested, a, a, a factor of that, right? Everybody wants to hold on to their spectrum because they think they're going to have future needs. But in, in terms of the international impact of what we've been doing, I think we, uh, I mean, some of these battles have probably been uh, negative for our position relative to the United States because we don't seem to be keeping the uh, squabbles in the house and but on the flip side some of our uh, our spectrum management practices I think have have really led the world in more efficient ways to allocate spectrum like we were the first to do spectrum auctions uh, and that's also coming up on an anniversary I guess because in, in the 1993 omnibus budget reconciliation act congress first gave the FCC authority to have spectrum auctions and the initial term is just five years. Of course, you know, like everything Congress does, right, that, that came about after a lot of thought leadership at the FCC and in industry and, you know, the FCC had a whole office that was looking at spectrum auctions. I think Evan Quirrell was given uh, an award last year by Chairwoman Rosen Marshall for his leadership on there, but obviously it was a big team. And in that regard, US has definitely been a leader in spectrum management and, and other countries followed suit because it, it is the most efficient way to allocate spectrum that is mutually exclusive. So we've had uh, you know, some shiny moments of, of spectrum leadership internationally, but, uh, but we've also been first in trying to do more innovative ways to, to manage spectrum and, and sharing, and you know, maybe Harold or Adam want to get into that, but, uh, because we've had a more crowded landscape in spectrum because of our role really as a global peacekeeper during the Pax Americana years, you know, we've had more intense use of spectrum by, by defense, uh, certainly more intensive use of, by, by some of the science agencies and other places. So we, we've had to be more innovative in spectrum use. But again, because of this crowded landscape, we get into more squabbles. And I think you know, we'll get into the discussion, I'm sure, later on how we, we seem to be having reached a consensus, you know, across the board between different houses of Congress and different agencies that we have to do a better job. And, you know, there is a new spectrum coordination agreement, as you know, between the, the FCC and NTIA. So I think industry is certainly uh, happy about that. But that's enough introductory, I suppose. And I'll turn it back to you, Danielle. Great. Um, let's uh, turn next to Adam. Um, if you'd like to add your perspective or from your prior role um, with NTIA, talk a little bit more about the Department of Commerce's involvement in um, the process and how NTIA has typically considered different agencies' concerns um, when the FCC is evaluating making certain spectrum available for commercial needs. Sure. So, um, first of all, I, I want to sort of build on um, uh, Trisha's, um, I think, very perceptive comments about, you know, the tremendous achievement of the FCC and the NTIA and this tremendous amount of spectrum repurposing. I mean, since 1990, the early, early 90s under Reed Hunt, the first auctions, um, and it really has been, you know, revolutionary when you think about what has been achieved. Um, and it's not just, oh, neat, I have these great smartphones that do neat things. Um, it really is a huge amount of repurposing of federal spectrum. 
Um, you know, one of the first things you learn when you get to NTIA is the largest user of spectrum in the world is the United States government. Um, and that has, you know, I, I think the US government deserves a pat on the shoulder um, for, you know, tremendous flexibility um, and uh, being able to do a huge amount of, of, of repurposing and, and moving around the spectrum map. Um, and that's unusual. Um, in many countries, you know, governments tend to be, you know, far more, you um, uh, how should we say myopic in their interests and um, uh, are not as willing to to play this sort of game that's so necessary in order to you know allow for rollouts. Um, second point, I mean, one of the things that really impressed me in NT in NTIA, and I, I think it's a it's sort of a culture of decision making. Um, and I, I, I'm usually hesitant to use such terms because they're so vague and amorphous, but I have something specific in mind is that, you know, you have these huge decisions with billions of dollars at stake and, you know, the whole constellation of these, you know, powerful DC forces, you know, pressuring this point and that. And then you sit with the engineers. And um, of course, sometimes they are also part caught up in this. But, you know, unlike lawyers, you know, they have into their bone, you know, so train into their training notions of efficiency and logic um, that, um, you know, I, I think in many ways sort of cons you know, constrains their politicization and sort of allows them to say, look, what's the best, here's the problem, what's the best efficient outcome in a way that I, I think lawyers don't do. I mean, I, we're all lawyers here, I think, I believe, um, you know, not to, you know, be smirch our kind, um, but we have different agendas and different ways of doing things. So, you know, I, I'm not often a, a great fan of, you know, the technical abilities of government to get things done, but this is in this discrete area where you're dealing with electrical engineers, where they are trained and acculturated into certain types of thinking. Um, you know, there is a real place, I think, for the sort of technocratic um, decision making. Okay, and now I guess, you know, <laughs> what everyone wants me to talk about, um, which is, um, of, of, of course, some um, 5G and, and, and some, you know, recent um, controversy about this. Um, you know, I think I'll just, just start by saying, you know, what this point, this whole um, situation points out is the need um, to avoid what happened. Um, you know, we have to have all concerns done in a timely manner. Um, and that requires cooperation of all agencies to come in with their concerns and not just their concerns, the hand-waving, because all of the agencies do hand-waving, you know. Um, they, they, they all present stories of very you know, dire things will happen unless we get our spectrum, but with evidence. Um, and I think that a lot, all of this problem could have been avoided had um, agencies come forth with serious evidence at the very beginning, um, rather than sort of a hand-waving um, uh, gesture. And that, because that's a real problem. If we, if we can't trust the process, then you know, we'll never repurpose spectrum again, because people will always come in the last minute and say, oh, you know, we have to do this. And then who's going to buy it? Because, you know, you don't have, as, as uh, Ronald Coase would say, uh, you know, a, a secure property interest. Um, and, and, and that's what I think we're all trying to work, work for. So I think I probably said enough. I hope I didn't say anything bad, but um, thank you. Harold, let's go to you next. Um, I really enjoyed the Spectrum Wars piece that you put out last week. Um, you raised a lot of really interesting points, one being the fact that the latest Spectrum Wars um, popped up where agencies were fighting the FCC for um, spectrum that had already been assigned for commercial use um, and therefore were um, you know, exclusively under the FCC's jurisdiction. Um, in light of this, do you think that there's been some kind of process failure here or, um, you know, are there process changes at necessary at this point in time? Well, yeah. And, and I think one of the things that I just want to make sure people understand, because I know this is not like a, a federal communications bar uh, association event where everybody comes in already kind of knowing what the state of the world is, but just... <coughs> Part of the problem is that spectrum is very, policy is very complicated because what you do impacts not just the set of frequencies that you're talking about, but potentially has impacts in other frequencies. So, and in addition to that, when we talk about, so what can you do with the spectrum? Well, it's always going to be that depends. You know, there are going to be some uses that are take up
up a lot of space, if you will, and are in some ways kind of primitive, like military radar, but we're always going to need military radar. By contrast, there are a lot of places where we could increase efficiency of government use, or we have different tools for increasing the uh, efficiency of the uh, uh, commercial use or different types of commercial use, where again, the idea that Congress has enshrined in the statute in recognizing all of this and said, okay, we're going to have an agency that does not itself use spectrum. So it doesn't have any interest. The FCC doesn't have, you know, any need for spectrum. It doesn't give itself anything. So it can be neutral in the uh, uh, rules and allocations. And we're going to have this one other agency that Congress ultimately um, created, NTIA, which is going to be the center spoke for federal users. And the problem here is both NTIA and the FCC are designed to be able to step back and look at the big spectrum picture. You know, how do we make these balancing questions? How do we deal with public safety in, you know, the state or local level versus what the FBI is using or the Secret Service is using? These are just enormously complicated questions. And what we have discovered now is that uh, there's a lot of agency uh, uh, use where it's not just that they don't trust the FCC, they also don't trust the NTIA. Uh, and where, frankly, uh, I think that there is also uh, a lot of problems with not having a shared set of language and assumptions and sets of responsibilities with regard to Spectrum. This came up during the hearing on the FAA C-band fight where you know, everyone was like, whoa, our engineers and their engineers just had no idea what each one was talking about. And, you know, part of this was, frankly, that the FAA kept saying, well, you can't do this until we've decided that it's safe. And the FCC said, okay, first of all, this is not your spectrum. And second of all, we have decided that the spectrum use is safe. So these are now the ground rules. You go off and, you know, if you need to fix some stuff to work within these ground rules, we have a working group, we'll work it out. Yeah. And AFAA was like, no, you can't do this until we decide that it's safe. And that's not how the process can work. Similarly, you know, NTIA has this sort of odd role because it's not supposed to be just a dumb pipe. There was a lot of talk about a letter that, you know, the DOT wanted to send through NTIA. And it's true, NTIA is supposed to be the the interface between the executive branch and the uh, um, the FCC. But part of that is the NTIA is not a dumb pipe that's just, and it's not a lawyer or advocate for individual agencies. It's a um, independent in the brain, in the sense of from other spectrum using agencies, not in the same way that the FCC is independent. Um, but it's an agency that it actually has its own labs, has its own engineers, does its own research, and can say, okay, it's true, FAA or DOE in the case of another proceeding or DOD in the case of different proceedings, you have a lot of valid points about your concerns, but we've got some world-class facilities that are not the FCC's facilities, that are, you know, the federal government, all of us here on the same side, and we think that this is what ought to happen. Agencies don't tend to like that. So the, the question of what processes need to be improved here, and we're at a very interesting inflection point because we've distributed most of the 5G spectrum, uh, we got one auction left in 2.5. There are some things that, but but mostly we're now trying to get lessons learned from here for 6G, which everybody is now kind of looking to as five or so years from now going to be, have its own demand for spectrum. That's the cycle. So how do we have a process where, number one, Congress needs to invest money. Congress needs to invest money in 
FCC engineers and lab testing capacity. Congress needs to invest more money in NTIA's engineers and lab testing capacity. People have to be up to date uh, on the latest technology. And also, these decision makers need to be able to go to the aerospace industry or the uh, the standard setting bodies for utilities doing their communications or whatever it is um, and uh, you know be able to follow those and incorporate that into their thinking uh, we also need congress to frankly invest money in more efficient spectrum technology for agencies there's an auction fund that does this after the fact for each time we say, okay, well, we're going to reallocate this band, so we will have a, the auction will take uh, an estimate of the federal cost, and we'll, you know, use that to, to move or reimburse, but we could do a lot more if we just sat down and said, okay, let's reinvest in more efficient technology so that folks like Secret Service don't have to be afraid of what's going to happen, because they'll have super efficient modern walkie-talkies and not something out of the 1960s. So there, there's a lot here that can be done in a kind of lessons learned way. Um, and kind of the biggest one is we have to rebuild trust. I mean, I, I, we don't like to think about the importance of individuals, but uh, Julie Knapp, who was the, uh, uh, the head of the Office of Engineering and Technology at the FCC for years and years and years before he you know, retired, was a national institution. And he just had developed all these relationships with all of the engineers in these other federal agencies and could bring folks together in a way that nobody else has replicated and we do need to spend time rebuilding those relationships can i jump in to add on to harold's points i mean of course i agree with them but yeah and part of it was with COVID, right some of those trust relationships just have laid neglected and as you said julie retired of course ron rapazzi you know in his shoes has been at the fcc for a while but he comes into the job and COVID hits and and people are off and you know do they have each other's cell phones do they know how to do a teams meeting is it authorized by the fcc it just a lot of that broke down during that period too so it but it, on the 6G point, and I think it's a very good one that, it, yeah, and you know, on the 5G side, yes, there's still spectrum that the 5G folks want from the FCC. Of course, we want that a lower 3.3 gigahertz band and up to 3.45. But um, yeah, on 6G, I think they're, to your point, Harold, they are trying to do a better job of 6G by this time through the next uh, G Alliance, right? Bring in the government folks on, in the front end and try to have these discussions going in and where can we all be? So we, we are trying to, or I should say, they, the industry and government writ large is trying to learn from those lessons and you know, have it be yeah, more, uh, more science-based and less controversial from the get-go. Yeah, and if I could just jump in as well, um, you know, from a somewhat more academic perspective, um, you know, when we talk about spectrum, it kind of, um, I don't know, an abstraction that doesn't, that, that um, is a little bit misleading because we're really talking about spectrum in relationship to devices. Um, and that, you know, spectrum, you don't just give away spectrum, you, use, you give away spectrum conditioned upon devices transmitting at certain power levels and at the same time having certain filtering um, and sensitivity abilities. And Engineers, they could. I mean, I actually, one of the things is when I'm back here at MSU, I've been spending a lot of time with electrical engineers, and it would be possible to develop metrics, um, I think, for um, looking at the sensitivity of the devices and creating a language, getting back to the notion of trust um, about interference and the levels of tolerable interference and the requirements of, of, of devices, um, you know, the sort of reasonable type of requirements that you can put in devices because you would have a common language. Um, I think that that's a, a, a real problem, particularly as we move to 6G um, and there's just gonna be more and more sharing issues. Uh, and there's, we're squeezing more and more into the spectrum. And that means that there's going to be, you know, more instruments that are going to be receiving out of band. Um, and we have to have some way of quantifying, some way of saying, look, this is an expectable range, this is not. Um, going back to the you know, FAA altimeters, I mean, it was almost 10 megahertz outside the band. I mean, that was one thing that was so weird about it. It was really outside um, of its band. And um, so, you know, 
putting that as a, a you know, looping in devices as part of the whole equation um, and creating language um, that we all can talk about it in, in a sort of you know, non-sectored way, um, I think would be a really great step forward. Yeah, and, and let me let me build on that a little bit, because again, I want to impress on people the difficulty here, because we say things like science-based, but in some ways, that's not helpful, because there is there are a lot of different factors that are all, if you think of them as sort of different dials you can tune. One of them is, what does interference mean? Well, interference has an engineering definition of unwanted uh, uh, noise to signal that you desire to the desired signal, but there's interference everywhere. You know, the, the, there is interference when I move this Diet Coke can because the electrons in here create a magnetic field. And so there's that little bit of, uh, uh, and now imagine you're in an airplane or there are thousands of cars driving by and those big pieces of metal are all moving. So there's interference globally all the time. So all systems are built to withstand interference. So we talk about harmful interference. Well, what is harmful interference? Well, that's interference that is harmful. Okay, what does that mean? It means it's interference that denigrates the service sufficiently so that it is harmful to, you, you see the problem. These are kind of self, to some degree, self-referential and where we get into this fight, you know, and the, the, the C-band was, was a great example. There are a number of different tools that engineers around the world use. One is the distance in frequencies, what we call guard band. And so here, even though technically the whole C-band abuts, um, you know, is, is this wide range that actually abuts up to the altimeter band, the FCC said, well, that 200 megahertz that is going uh, to be close to the altimeter band is not gonna be usable for, for C-band, so for 5G and C-band. So that's what we call a guard band. Technically that wasn't quite a guard band because there was, pre-existing traffic there that everybody agreed wasn't causing problem but that kind of idea is called a guard band just empty space between transmitters then there's what's called emission mask meaning how much energy can go outside of your assigned frequencies because you know electrons and and you know the the radiant energy that we're talking about is hard to control so particularly back in older days we've now gotten a lot better about this but you know in the old days part of the reason why you needed like big space for example in television we have these very big um guard bands these six megahertz empty channels um or more between assignments because those were big, powerful transmissions and the energy would leak out and it would cause interference. You know, if you listen to a radio or, or an old television, you may remember you start to see this kind of blurry shape or a mix of the, that's the leakage. But the problem with the C-band stuff was that uh, Adam was referring to is what we call listening out of band, which is when you're a device manufacturer and you say, hey, it costs more money for me to narrow the range of frequencies that my device listens to. So if I know that the neighbors next door are quiet, I can make a much cheaper device that listens in those neighboring bits. And then, you know, 10 years later, the little quiet countryside is now getting a housing development equivalent in it. Um, and you're like, what happened to all of my peace and quiet that I have come to? Well, you didn't actually have a right to that peace and quiet because we could always develop this. And those are the kinds of fights we're seeing um, where to some degree it's a, okay, who has the right? What is the right? And then how do you deal with the fact on the ground? In this case, one of the frustrating things about C-Band was we could have dealt with it if, you know, instead of saying no 5G never, the Department of Transportation and FAA had taken the position of set up a fund of money to reimburse people who have to upgrade their, uh, uh, their altimeters, you know, we could have done that. But instead, because they went in a particular direction, um, it was, uh, you know, we ended up with the, the with a uh, mess, which is the 
um, former or, or almost former FAA administrators said, did not serve anybody particularly well. Well, and you guys have, um, we've talked a little bit about using this scenario, you know, as a lesson to be learned um, or a, you know, potential source of learning lessons, but we're not done with C-band yet, right? So before we move on to some of these other, you know, um, other spectrum conflicts or um, shift our focus entirely to the process, I mean, what comes next here? You know, we um, have temporary mitigation measures in place at the moment, but it's not really clear what's going to happen this summer. Um, do you guys have any thoughts on that or, um, you know, if, if there is room for further engagement here at this point? I'll, I'll jump in before Harold, but uh, hey. yeah, because the, I mean, as Harold noted, right, you've got different groups of engineers, but the FAA does not have a bunch of spectrum engineers. They were not up to this. And frankly, from what I've heard, uh, unlike the relationship with the industry and the FCC, I mean, some might think it's too cozy, but it's a broad competitive industry. You know, I've heard that there's, there's even, there's, there's capture at the FAA, right? So they, they did not impose very strict altimeters. And for people who are wondering what the hell is an altimeter, sorry to swear on a FedSoc panel. That's the radar, right? Which is, you know, bouncing off the ground as the plane is landing. So it's a piece of safety equipment. Now, traditionally, it's certainly an international spectrum management. Safety equipment has mandatory guidelines, but the FAA did not have very strict mandatory guidelines for those altimeters, the radars that are helping land the plane safely. And, and they, unlike a smartphone where a better chip might cost you five dollars you know altimeters are pretty expensive they're you know they're thirty thousand or so dollars they're meant to live you know twenty thousand meant to live for a long long time 30 years so there you know there was uh, there was not a lot of enthusiasm by the uh the the aviation community to swap those out now would a, a reimbursement fund have been a good idea possibly but that wasn't put on the table i think when chairman then chairman pie first you know proposed this back in 2018 but but to answer the question, the FAA is now going through the process of testing all these altimeters. And on some of the planes, obviously to the bigger major routes and the, the newer fleets, the Boeing 747s, and you know, the altimeters are fine. They're 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 better. They're they're not listening far outside their band. They're they've got tighter receivers. But you know, on these tiny little routes in the third tier of airports out in the country, you know, maybe older, older aviation fleets. You know the altimeters probably they need to be replaced so they're still reviewing right but so who knows the faa might have learned from this lesson and thought okay this was a huge debacle we need to get through all this review by you know july when you know after the fourth of july uh holiday when we're supposed to get the free and clear but there is a chance they get through that whole review and we won't have another debacle in the second half of 22 where we get more uh you know the, the little boy crying wolf. I do think the FAA lost a lot of uh, credibility over this process and they're not gonna pull that that again. I could be wrong, but I, and I assume the FCC, well, you're, you're the FCC, Danielle. I assume there's talks underway with the FAA making sure that we don't have a, another nightmare, but sorry. Okay, now Harold, you can- Yeah, I mean, just, just a couple of things I'll say in fairness to the FAA, one of the problems was is they didn't think they needed to worry about the, uh, um, setting an altimeter standard, which is, again, kind of the thoughtlessness of when people tell me, well, but the FAA is the expert on, uh, you know, air safety. I'm like, yeah, but that's not the same as being a spectrum expert. And, you know, they didn't think there was ever going to be anything to worry about. If somebody invented an altimeter today, if the situation were reversed and we had wireless networks deployed and somebody said i have this great safety radar this altimeter thing you know that the itu has apportioned this band for well you know we'd start with can you protect it from the existing environment uh, and the situation is even worse than just in july because it was only the lower c band that came online in 2023 we're going to have the licenses that are 100 megahertz closer to the altimeter band. And it's been troubling that the FAA has not even, you know, using its clearance process, hasn't even officially cleared for uh, the post-July uh, 
um, uses of the band, uh, let alone the anticipated uses of the band uh, going forward uh, in, uh, you know, in 2023. But to kind of learn from this and, and try to take some general principles here, I'd say, look, because it's not just this, it's also 5.9 gigahertz in uh, with uh, uh, the Department of Transportation's NTSB. Um, there are a couple of other places where it's just where federal agencies just don't want to lose. And so the first rule of this really has to be like, okay, once the FCC decision is made and it's final, that's the accepted law of the universe. So, you know, FAA altimeter, FAA, if an altimeter can't work is, you know, is not working in this environment, you need to fix the altimeter. Now, you know, if that's going to be super expensive to the industry, I expect we'll solve it the way we usually do, which is in an appropriations bill. Somebody will write out a number and, you know, federal funds will be made available. We, in fact, did that with the 5.9 uh, uh, band where the FCC had in 1999 set aside spectrum uh, for an auto tech collision avoidance technology that never went anywhere. And after futzing around for 20 years, the FCC finally said, okay, you know what? We're going to phase out the 1999 technology. We're going to bring in a new, more efficient technology, which is called uh, uh, CV to X, uh, cell based on 5G cellular uh, transmission. And because it's a more efficient technology, we're only going to give you we're going to take back 45 megahertz of the 75 that we'd allocated in 1999 and leave you with 30, which, given the newer cap capabilities of the spectrum, actually should be able to do more. Well, the DOT has been running a bunch of experiments, not simply on the how do we use this 30 and implement CV to X in the most effective way, but also what awesome, wonderful things could we do if we got the 45 megahertz back? And isn't all this, you know, Wi-Fi activity going to cause all kinds of interference? And I'm like, you are not accepting the law of the universe that exists now. You know, to, to quote a particular movie, what we have here is a failure to communicate. This is, you know, you could either say we have 30 megahertz, you know, we have a pretty good technology. It's LTE. We know what 30 megahertz block contiguous of LTE can do, you know, and we know what kind of interference protection we're going to have to build into the devices, or we could try to relitigate it. Same thing with the FAA. You can either say, okay, the FCC has given us until 2023, knowing what the rules are, you know, are altimeters as they exist now up to this? Are they going to need some kind of upgrade? You know, and if so, how are we going to manage to get that paid for? Because I have a certain sympathy for people who are, you know, helicopters operators for hospitals or, you know, well, folks who bought uh, small planes who didn't do anything wrong. You know, it's, it's one of these, but times change. And, you know, just as we, uh, uh, paid everybody uh, 50 bucks for a coupon to convert to DTV um, so that it didn't have to come out of the pockets of consumers. I don't mind if we, uh, uh, you know, need to take auction revenue or some other sort of federal uh, uh, appropriation so that hospitals uh, can upgrade uh, their helicopters. But you you can't hold back progress over that. Yeah, and um, I just... Building on what um, Harold said, um, so you know, reporters are calling me um, with their FOIA. Um, they got some of their FOIA request responses um, about some of this process, and you know about the um, C band. Um, and I think it, it picks up a lot of what um, Harold and and and, and Trisha were talking about. Um, I didn't, you know, I wasn't there at NTIA um, after the 2019 order where the FCC, as Harold said set the rule you know this is what we're going to do or had you know the NPRM and then the final rule and of course that goes through an internal Iraq process where you know all these federal agencies go and they talk about you know what has to be done um and I, I didn't know about this but apparently the the FAA did you know submit comments and it said you know we're really concerned this is bad this is a terrible thing and that's it um, and you know, the, the, so we talk about process. I mean, what you have to do is, is, is you know, I guess inculcate into um, agencies that okay, 
is this a problem? Give us cost estimates for a remediation plan. Um, you know, suggest alternatives. Um, do the real sort of evidence to show what kind of problems this is. Because you know, the fact that the FAA didn't do the census and the certification of all of their their altimeters in in 2018 when they saw this coming. Um, you know, suggest so this attitude of like, oh, this is a problem we can handle politically. Um, and rather than just sort of saying, okay, this is the law, we have to come up with technical measures to, you know, make sure that our regulatory goals of, of you know, air safety are maintained. Um, and, you know, that means figuring out the size of the problem, which they never really did. They just waved their hands and said, this is a real problem. And two, you know, okay, if it's the law of the land and, and the spectrum's, you know, going to 5G, you know, what are what are the appropriate and cheapest and safest remediation efforts? Um, and that's the sort of dialogue that has to happen before, not after. Well, one bright spot on this is the law of the land is the, the, the DC Court of Appeals and the six gigahertz rulemaking did come back in, in late December um, you know, on another band of spectrum, uh, not the ones we've been talking about, but saying you know, the FCC is the arbiter on what is going to be harmful interference, what is appropriate technical conditions for sharing, you know, companies, you can try to relitigate it, but the FCC is the authority. So I, I think going forward, that will help with some of these interagency fights but I, or discussions. And again, I think that the C-band, I will call it a debacle, was so embarrassing for everybody that, you know, that hopefully they'll be inspired to behave better. And then you do have the spectrum coordination initiative between NTI and FCC where they've agreed. And I, I understand from folks in the government, they're already meeting at the principal level. So with, you know, Chairwoman Rosenworcel and, and, you know, Assistant Secretary Davidson, they, they, they are meeting. So I think they're, they're looking to move forward, but real quick, you know, there is an international context too, you know, Harold, both on, on a lot of these bands, right. But on, on 5.9, for instance, 5.9 gigahertz, which as Harold noted that the FCC said, hey, you know, we think we don't need all that spectrum for, for, for automotive safety. The lower 45 megahertz we're going to give to the Wi-Fi folks because there's new technology there. We're going to have broader uh, bands, faster broadband. That's all great. So do we just need the 45 megahertz at the top of the band? That's great. But internationally, the world, which does not move or respond as quickly as the United States does in spectrum policy because of our more dynamic process here, you know, the world is kind of stuck on their 75 megahertz. There's lots of ITUR, you know, the International Telecommunication Union recommendations on that that come out of the United Nations body on, on telecom. You know, they folks in the CV2X industry are, are active in those international discussions. So you have that. And then, yeah, on the flip side and C-band, you had about a hundred operators globally that are doing 5G and C-band and some, some level of it. And including there, you know, there are operators up to 4.0. So for the second chunk of spectrum that the FCC will put online, you know, so that's a positive aspect of the international scene because there will be studies, there are studies being done on on coexistence between altimeters and you know and 5G all the way up to 4.0 and actually even higher up to 4.2. So hopefully there'll be enough um, you know global studies coming out that that will help you know. Yeah, I, I, just, the just global element, anybody from more funny business. Yeah. yeah, the global element is very interesting because one of the things is on the one hand you want global standards and it's a global market now, and also you need harmonization at the borders. At the same time, the U.S. leads, um, and you know that isn't just rah rah USA USA. The fact is that we invented the entire concept of unlicensed spectrum. We invented the entire concept of spectrum auctions. You know, in, in both cases, these were radical things that the world thought we were crazy uh, uh, for doing. We invented the incentive auction uh, structure, which. You know, we in you know we are the ones who led on the uh, DTV transition and reclaiming you know that spectrum that was na internationally allocated and harmonized for broadcast spectrum and saying we've got to start taking some of that back and using the broadcast space more efficiently. So, on the one hand, yeah, it's we we can't ignore the rest of the world and we shouldn't ignore the rest of the world. Um, and we negotiate with the rest of the world. One of the big problems that has come up in these interagency fights was 
every three years there's the World Radio Conference that the ITU uh, puts on, and the United States spends a bunch of time trying to develop both an, a consistent internal position and then a uh, um, you know regional uh, position to go for these international uh, negotiations that are for those of you who have never participated in them, both insanely boring, but also insanely important. Um, and, uh, you know, we had problems last time because the NOAA was not happy with what was the U.S. official position on uh, um, a particular spectrum band. And folks from that agency, and this is where, you know, part of the problem really comes in, whatever the, quote, official process is, you had folks from that agency go with strategic leaks to the press and with uh, leveraging um, intercommittee fights um, between uh, the space, uh, um, uh, whichever uh, committee is jurisdiction over, over space uh, and uh, the one uh, that uh, is commerce and energy and commerce, which have, you know, and this is a consistent problem. And this is where we really need to point to Congress and say, members of Congress need to show some discipline and some restraint here, difficult as that is to compel. But the reality is that if you listen to the, the hearing that, uh, um, you know, uh, the House uh, Transportation and Infrastructure Committee had uh, after uh, the C-band uh, debacle, while most members were talking sense about how, you know, this this was not good, this can't be allowed to happen again. You had the chairman, DeFazio, out there saying, well, the FCC is awful, and we ought to let my committee um, have some decision-making authority here. You know, Armed Services does that occasionally, too. And as long as, you know, what uh, um, these guys, you know, are willing to um, carry the water for agencies going outside of the process, we're not going to be able to develop a coherent spectrum policy. Well, so you guys have touched on some of these other conflicts. I mean, CBN and FAA was definitely the most headline worthy and is probably um, the most familiar to people outside of the, this space. Um, but we did have, as you just mentioned, 24 gigahertz band where NOAA and NASA and others um, were involved in 5.9. We had Department of Transportation. Um, to your point, the US has long been a leader in spectrum policy, um, but these are not just one-off conflicts at this point. It's been, you know, there have been multiple instances of, um, you know, these arising spectrum battles kind of at the 11th hour. So what, what is the impact long-term, if any, um, you know, on the global viewpoint of the, U.S. engineering decisions, um, FCC engineering decisions, or um, our spectrum policy decisions more broadly? Well, I, I think there's a serious concern that the world will lose faith in us. Um, that uh, if we are perceived as, I mean, first of all, it is enormously frustrating to me that as part of this, you see uh, efforts by um, other industries or other agencies to undermine the uh, uh, the expertise and the public safety concerns of the FCC and the NTIA, um, where, you know, when I hear people say, oh, well, but what does the FCC know about, you know, protecting safety? I'm like, every day, if you've ever ridden in an ambulance, you know, you've depended on the FCC's, uh, um, you know, spectrum uh, uh, engineering expertise to protect public safety. If you've, you know, ever had to deal with things like FirstNet and how first responders respond, that's the FCC at work. And the engineers that I know there are super aware of the fact that if they screw up, it can kill people. Um, so, uh, but when people strategically undermine the FCC's um, you know, expertise in this area, you know, that not only is just, you know, frankly insulting to a lot of people who are, who care and do their jobs and, you know, in a lot of cases, I think, frankly, have their spectrum training a hell of a lot more recently than you did, um, but uh, uh, the, yeah, it undermines the faith that the world puts in 
our um, spectrum uh, recommendations and spectrum policy. And that has the potential to seriously compromise uh, our uh, ability to take a leadership role uh, at the ITU, um, to uh, have uh, a strong uh, role in industry standard setting, uh, international industry standard setting body, and it is it is harmful in the long run if it continues. Yeah, just if I could just quickly jump in and, and reiterate some points from Harold. I'm um, just one th one thing. FirstNet is 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 um is an NTIA um uh, agency. It's just just, just uh, <laughs> agency fighting. Um, <laughs> right, right. They 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 run it, but the original yeah, yeah. Spectrum right, Engineering right, exactly. with them. So um, but um, no, I mean I think that's that's so correct. I, you know, there has to be. These issues are partly political and they're partly technical, and they're they they, they have to be settled. Um, hopefully, with more technical, and more science than with politics. Um, but there has to be time and place for it. Um, and if you know it becomes if it bleeds out into um, you know special pleading, whether through congressional um, congressional committees or through you know post hoc um, uh, sort of performances, um, we just will lack confidence, um, not simply in the process, but you know, people just won't bid on these on the spectrum. And we won't get the new technologies that we want, um, not because they can't be safely utilized with existing technology, but because people don't want to risk the money. I mean, this is not, these auctions aren't like, you know, the the um you, you know your local christmas um church benefit where you know if we cancel the the auction on march we can have it on april and you know we'll find someone to bid on the you know ugly misen figurine i mean these are billions and billions of dollars that have to be carefully set and and are structured and organized so they can bid on that time and if, if you pull the rug from under these people it's just not going to happen. We're not going to get this sort of um, technology development that we need to you know, survive in, in against China. And I would just add, you know, the irony of so many bills from the Senate and the House, you know, basically directing the administration to go make sure the U.S. is strong in these international set setting, you know, organizations, including the ITU, including the, the industry bodies. But it's it, it's true. If if our standing internationally is undermined by you know, the, the fact that many of the uh, special pleaders have special reception up on their committees of jurisdiction, you know, it, they're defeating their own goals. So I, I agree, we all need to be pulling with the same set of oars. Um, since we only have a few minutes left, I wanna make sure that we do get to the questions that are in the chat. Um, the first one from Nick Lehman um, is, you may be aware that NSF has funded a National Center for Spectrum Innovation called Spectrum X and has an MOA with the FCC and NTIA to steer it. From the perspective of this community, how can we engage and collaborate to pursue impactful R&D, disseminate results, and train the future workforce? Would any of you like to take that one? Uh, I do know of, of clients who are engaged in that. I, I, being a lawyer, I'm not, uh, not actually you know, engaged, but I, I think there's an application process that so you might want to if you feel you have something to contribute to that, you might want to reach out to the agencies and, and apply to participate. Yeah, I, I, I do think that, um, um, you know, it is important. Uh, I think that uh, um, it's important also to follow these processes as the research is done. Um, NSF does a lot of very good fundamental research and, um, you know, their virtue is that their stuff will pay off in the long run. It doesn't necessarily have to pay off uh, next quarter. Uh, and uh, uh, they take seriously serious um, feedback. And so uh, I think that, uh, um, you know, well, even if you don't apply now to participate as the uh, process goes on and the NSF uh, uh, publishes uh, the results of its research, there will be opportunities um, to, uh, uh, to take that research and uh, to uh, uh, provide uh, important feedback as well. Yeah, and again, I'm not exactly familiar with the structure, but you know, the, one of the so these problems is that this, you know, for instance, the spectrum people at DoD are fantastic, um, but you know, the spectrum people at the FAA, you know, I think I, I mean I don't know any of them, of course, but I mean, you know, 
it would be wonderful if they were folded in into a into a community where they were also learning to speak the same language and understand the same concerns. And you know, to the degree that you know we that this can reach out beyond the FAA and the NTIA to the spectrum people who are embedded with the other agencies, um, you know, I think that can only sort of build trust and increase knowledge um, and uh, an understanding of, of the concerns that we all face. Um, and I think that brings us to the next question that was asked um, by an anonymous attendee. What lessons should the new FAA administrator learn from his or her predecessor as they relate to interagency cooperation and spectrum management, particularly as we finish up with 5G and start moving to 6G? And I, I want to set the stage on that. We're not finishing up with 5G anytime soon. I mean, you know, with these standards, there's different releases where they make more of the features available. I mean, 5G is just starting to be deployed. I mean, we, we have a lot of uptake. It's the fastest generation of mobile, uh, you know, broadband that's you know, in terms of its you know, hockey stick growth, but it, it's a long tail. And, and 6G is expected to be rolled out in about 2030. So we, we're a good eight years away, but, you know, and obviously the standard setting is working, but I, you know, obviously I think the lessons learned, we, we kind of hit on those earlier, but if others want to address, I just want to, you know, I, I, do wanna, with 5G. I do want to jump in, uh, uh, on this with regard to the FAA specifically, which is um, to number one, um, take a broad approach in the altimeter survey and not a narrow one. Um, you know, when I heard that they were only testing for the current set of spectrum circumstances and not also being forward-looking with their uh, alternative means of compliance AMOC process um, to consider the post-July yeah, environment as well and then them recertify every month. I was like, why? Why Why would you do that? The equipment is not going to change. Um, and again, you know what the environment will be that you have to test for. So my biggest advice is assume the existing environment. Don't assume that we're going to relitigate it and work within those constraints. And to the extent that there are identified problems, then you can go and see, is it more efficient to try to arrange certain things? Because some things are cheaper than others. If you're talking about tilt of the antenna, you know, that's different from trying to reduce power levels. And again, one other thing I just want to stress, you know, for the FAA folks and, and, and other federal agencies is, Network operators spend years planning these deployments. You cannot show up right before they are about to flip on a switch and expect there to be little or no impact, even if you're saying, well, let's just like, you know, have an exclusion zone around an airport. First of all, if you have an exclusion zone of a mile or whatever around a major airport in a lot of major airports, you know, Boston, New York, Newark, Washington, D.C., you are cutting out huge chunks of the network. Um, but even if they are places where that is not going to be the case, you have to do all of this new compensation work to make sure that the network functions at a, uh, um, at a decent level of quality. Um, the other is, you know, and, and I mean this with all due respect to the FAA and to everyone else, get over yourself. Seriously, yes, you are important, but this isn't just, this isn't as you like to phrase it, safety of airplanes versus cat videos. People live or die on the capacities of these wireless networks too. Everybody who's trying to reach 911, everybody who's using this for telemedicine, everybody who's using all the first responders who are going to be using these similar technologies, those are life and death technologies too. So yeah. You're part of the mix, you're important, you're not ignored, but get over yourself. Um, with that, I think um, in our last minute, if you guys have any closing remarks or final thoughts um, that you'd like to add on, I think that would be wonderful. And Harold, I could not agree with you more on, on those final points. I don't have closing thoughts, but there is another uh, question in the chat about when the US or the FCC is going to publish 
technical coexistence studies between 5G and altimeters. I don't think the, the FCC is doing that because y'all have already spoken and I don't expect further publication, but you know, if Danielle, if you have any insights for our guest from Saudi Arabia. Oh, thank you for pointing that out too. I was looking at the Q&A box, not the chat box. Um, I do not think that the FCC is going to be publishing any um, additional technical coexistence studies, um, but can look into it and see if there's anything else that's forthcoming, but not to the best of my knowledge. I just have one final thought I'd like to give, which is this doesn't have to be a contentious process. There is a great success story in the 3.55 CBRS band where the FCC nego was negotiating for shared use with the U.S. Navy and um, with the DOD. And, you know, it took several years of engineers working together in rooms, working uh, uh, to establish the technology and develop a, because this was a new proposal, new technology that, you know, folks were a little nervous about, but they got to a place where DOD was comfortable and they were able to expand the availability of the spectrum to eliminate the previously required exclusion zones. And that has been uh, an enormous success story. So um, while we are focused understandably right now on where the process has been contentious, um, we should also uh, remember that, uh, you know, when, when the pieces work together, we can really have some tremendous wins for efficiency, for national security, and for uh, uh, commerce all combined. It's not zero sum. Right, and I, I think that, that I, I agree completely, and it sort of reminds me of the you know, initial comments, which was when you can get you know, spectrum engineers in a room together, they often will come up with really novel and um, efficient solutions, and that's what we should aim to have most of our spectrum discussions at, not at these weird other fora and in other institutional contexts that maybe aren't as productive. Well, with that, thank you guys so much for joining for this discussion. Um, I think it was a wonderful discussion, robust discussion. I'll turn it back over to Nick to close us out. Yeah, thank you all. I just have our customary Federalist Society thanks. Um, thank you very much to our panelists. Uh, all of you did really well. It was a great discussion. I really enjoyed it. Uh, Danielle for moderating and helping us put this program together. Thank you to our audience for calling in your good questions. Um, as always, be keeping an eye on your email and our website for announcements about upcoming events just like this one. Uh, but until that next one, we are adjourned. Thank you all.